Um, I'm Derek. I'm your instructor for the uh, Operating Systems class. Um, and today we're going to be going over uh, an example from um, what I'm calling our Unit 4. This is basically at the end of Chapter 7, a, uh, um, a buffer overflow um, attack, basically, on memory, okay? So we should probably talk more about security uh, nowadays and in, in, um, in general in our computing classes. So, but this was a good example. Um, Although it's a little bit dated, um, but, um, but, but but first of all, um, so we're looking at um, a buffer overflow attack. So this particular example uses the git s function, which has been kind of um, deprecated and you can't really use it anymore. But even though the, the example in the textbook is a bit dated, uh, I mean, buffer overflows are still very much common, a very uh, a common security vulnerability. So I would say... They're probably still the most common kind of security vulnerability that that people, um, you know, that, that hackers make use of to attack and get into a system. Okay, so a buffer overflow is basically just any time where you have a condition where you can end up getting more input can be placed into some buffer or some data holding area than than the capacity that was allocated or allowed for it. Okay. So the, the danger with that is that if, if you're not careful in, in checking your input um, and, and more, you can allow more than, than you had capacity for, you'll end up overriding other information, okay? So, I mean, at best, at attackers, so at best, you know, maybe not somebody malicious, but somebody might run into that and end up crashing your system because you're writing off into memory you don't expect, so you're getting unexpected results, okay? But at worst, it could be a possibility that an attacker could exploit that condition to um, insert specially crafted input that would allow them to gain control of the system, okay? And, and this example uh, from the end of Chapter 7 shows the basic idea of how a buffer overflow attack works, okay? So technically, what we're going to be looking at today is known as a stack overflow or a stack smashing uh, um, attack. But that's basically just because the buffers um, that we are overflowing here are being allocated on, on what's known as the function call stack, okay? So... Um, so I'm going to show a little bit of debugging here, and so if if if, uh, if you don't know what like the function call stack is and things like that, you'll see a, a little bit about that. Okay, so um, let me start by I'm, I'm going to start by running this um, example uh, in the debug mode. Okay, so we'll step through it first with a, a successful. Um, example of running it. Okay, so this is meant to I mean again it's only an example. This is meant to simulate typically what might happen for um, a password authentication that you might be doing you know so if you're building a system and you need to authenticate users to allow them to get in um, and use your system you might ask them for a password and then you check that password against a stored password um, and if they typed in the right one you would let them in you know you'd give them authentication and if they get it wrong you wouldn't allow them in right so first of all um, if you haven't Use the debugger or been using the debugger. Um, so we did set it up in Atom. Um, the basic thing that you need to do, so first of all, I do need to build this. So I'll, make, I'll make certain that everything's built here. Uh, again, you could use Atom to build. I'll just build it from the command line. So, so it should build cleanly and it, and it creates an executable called buff. Okay, so, oh, and by the way, I'm in the, U0, the unit 04 buffer overflow example. So we've got. Um, a program. This this is just a plain C program. Okay, so I'm actually using printf and things like that um, instead of a C++ program. So anyway, so when you'll notice when you compile it that it actually uses GCC instead of G++. All right. Um, so anyway, our, our, and, and another thing. So uh, by default, we're using the dash G flag. So that means compile it with debug information on. So if we want to use the debugger, you need to compile your code with this dot dash g flag for a, 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 a g a, a c plus plus or a c compiler it uses that that flag. So so let's set it up so we can run a debug session. Um, now the debugger in Atom isn't actually all that good, uh, but it has the basics. Okay, so if we go to debug um, if, and we can configure a custom debug system, I, I've already done this. So like uh, if you choose your executable that was compiled with the debug information in there so if we choose that um, and then you can save that if you want to right 
So then to start a debug session, um, I want to set a breakpoint. So like um, we'll just set a breakpoint. You can set a breakpoint visually by just clicking over in the, the gutter here next to the um, line number. So if we set a breakpoint in main, like in our first statement, so, so we'll start right off. So remember main is the first um, <clears throat> function that's called when you start running a program. So and, and we're going to stop the debugger. So we're going to set what's known as a breakpoint right on the very first instruction in our main function here, right? So we can start the debugger from you know going into the pa packages debug um, start or use F5. Uh, here to do that. So you have to use F5, you have to select which debug session that you saved. You want to run. So we want to use the, the buff session here. When you run um, on Windows with a debugger, it, it pops up. So any input and output is going to be into this new terminal, um, command line terminal that pops up. So you need to keep track of that. Uh, pay attention to these over on the left. So this is standard stuff for a debugger. So uh, by default, when you start the debugger in Atom, it, it shows your call stack and your variables. You can also show your breakpoint by clicking on that, and you can hide any of these if you want. Usually, you definitely want your call stack and your um, uh, variables to be shown. Okay. So right now, we're currently in the main function, so, so we, we don't have any other function but the main function on our call stack, and, and we, we stop right at our first breakpoint here. Right? And, and the variables show the local variables, okay? So, so if you don't know the way that, that function calls work in a computing system, basically all variables that you define that are local to a function get put on what's known as the function call stack, all right? So in this case, and also parameters. So in this case, argc, argv, which I won't describe it, just think of these as parameters, like any normal parameter to a, a C function. Um, and also, we've got three other variables, um, an int called login successful, and two arrays of characters um, are all local variables. So that these are all listed um, as the variables um, in the current frame um, on our call stack here, argc, argv, login successful, and so on. And, and notice you can also see what the values are of these, all right? So we didn't initialize. So we did initialize login successful. So this is the, again, this is plain C. Um, so I don't have like a boolean built-in type like I do in C++. So we're just using an integer for a boolean result. Uh, but you can see that that we initialize login successful to be zero here. False is zero. Zero is false, and one is used for true in C. Um, and we, but we didn't initialize these array of characters. So these are old style, old style C arrays that so we can use for string processing. And we've only got enough room in each of these for eight characters, okay? But but they just have garbage in them. So if I expand that, you can see it looks like um, the the, co the ASCII codes or the values in there are mostly zero or just kind of random uh, values in, in those two variables, all right? Um, so in the debugger down here, I mean, you've got your, like I said, the basics. So it works just for basic debugging in Atom. So, you know, we can continue from here um, to the next breakpoint, although we don't have another breakpoint set. So again, we can see, so the, our only breakpoint is the one here on line 63 um, that we're currently at right now. Uh, we can stop debugging, um, or, or the main ones are we could step over or step into things, okay, or step out of. Of, of functions, okay? So normally you want to step over things unless you're at a function that you want to step into. So you can start stepping from that function, right? So let's try stepping into the retrieve stored password, okay? So if we step into that, so notice, so we're now, we now called the retrieve stored password and we're stepping through the code of that. So uh, call your attention to the call stack here. So now we've got two functions in our call stack. We started in the main function and now at the top of the the call stack is we're in the retrieve stored password function, okay? And again, so if, if you notice down here on the variables, we've only got one local variable, actually a parameter. So we passed in stored password, this buffer, as our parameter here. So that, that's our variable locally. If, if you, cl you can click on these, so if you want to go back to your, your main frame, I can click on main and, uh, and I'm back to here. So, so now I'm within the context of my main function, and these are my local variables for main, right? And I can go back to my call stack by clicking up here. So, but this is the top of my call stack, so this is the code that I'm currently um, executing, right? So again, in this example, this is a made-up example, but this is supposed to... Um, this is supposed to simulate what you would do in an actual password authentication 
system. So normally we would be like retrieving our password from like a file or maybe more likely a database nowadays, okay? And hopefully, you know, you're, you're not storing your password as like a plain text password like we're doing here. So hopefully you've hashed the password um, so that even people that, that can access the password, they, they still couldn't, you know, access your system if they see the, the password hash, right? So... Uh, but anyway, so, so for illustration purposes, we're just using a plain password, um, plain text password. So our password is a secret. So that was the password that the user uh, entered um, that they want to use to authenticate themselves on our system again. And all this, this function does is it copies the password that it retrieved into the buffer that we asked for. So we can use that to, to check what the user enters to see if they entered the correct password or not. So if I, if I st continue stepping, if I step over this, uh, so, so now after this, um, I should have showed you this, so now after we did the copy, so again we're using old style C program here, so a plain C program, so we have to use, so we can't use like string objects like in C++, so we have to use the, the string library functions like string copy and string compare and things like that. So this just copied these seven characters into the store password, okay? Um, and another thing I should point out, um, now that I'm thinking about it, or at this point, so remember, let me go ahead and step out of this here. So if you step over, um, we will return from the function. So now we pop off the, the retrieve stored password function, and we're back into the main function, okay? Um, but um, so, so both the stored password and the user inner password, we only created a buffer of size 8 for this, okay? So that when we retrieved the store password, the, the, the password was a secret, which was seven characters. But the way that strings work in C, using character arrays in, in plain C is that we have to have a, a null character at the end of our strings to indicate the end of string. So that, that's how functions like string copy and string compare know when they've got to the end of, the, of, of your array of characters to represent a string. So we actually copied eight characters into the stored password. So the characters a secret, um, those seven visible characters, plus then the the null character, right? So I'm fine. I, I don't think so. Like if you um, let, me, let me close my breakpoints here, so I have a little bit more. So oh yeah, so so yeah, you can actually see that fact. So in the debugger here, so if you look, open up the uh, your stored password. Um, after we've got it in there, so we see that the eight characters. So the, these are the ASCII code. So that so the ASCII code or the integer value for to represent uh, uh, a uppercase A is a sixty five and so on. Uh, so our, our our first seven characters in index zero through six are a secret, and then the the eighth character at index seven is the null character to indicate the end of our um, array of characters here for string processing in C. All right, so that's that's. So now we, we've set up, the, we've retrieved our password, so we want to do the user authentication, all right? So again, we, we haven't initialized the, the, the password that the user entered yet, so it's, it's still garbage, right? So it just, what was ev whatever was in memory on our stack when we entered our main function is in those eight um, characters for the user entered password, all right? So now if I step over the next one, um, it's going to print out a message on my terminal, so let's step over that, all right? Uh, so it's not actually asking for my password yet, so we see the message. So if I try to type, if you try to type something here now, you might be a bit confused because you won't see your output, all right? So um, if I step over this, it, it's actually in the git s function, okay? So git s is uh, known to be unsecure, and in fact, it's deprecated. Um, so in lots of places, you can't actually compile with git s anymore. It's not available in the the standard library. It's it's deprecated because it doesn't check the input to guard against buffer overflows, exactly like we're um, demonstrating here. All right. So let, let's um, let's let's step. So if we step over that, we're at the point where it's waiting for me to enter a password. So let's show a successful authentic authentication here. So the password is a secret. I'll enter a secret. And hit and hit return. So, git s doesn't return until you hit until you hit return. 
So now we're back on our next statement. Uh, so now if you look at the user entered password, it's a secret. And again, it's actually, actually put eight characters in there. Put the, the seven visible characters plus the, the null terminating character. All right. So just to finish this off here, um, the, our, our example program that I gave you, um, so we'll use the, the, the C library, string library function string in compare. So this function takes two arrays of characters and it returns zero if they're equal. Uh, it does that because um, it returns like a negative value if the first um, character array is alphabetically before the other one. And it returns a positive value if the first one is, at, is after the other one. So you can use string in compare for like sorting functions. It's, it'll tell you which one comes first and second, that kind of thing. But here, all we're interested in is, so if it's zero, that means that they were equal, okay? And that, in that case, that means that they successfully entered the correct password, right? So we, we expect that, that we should get a result of zero here um, if we step over. So, you know, if you look down here, and, and Adam, this is kind of nice. It, it, it puts these little, uh, I can't remember what it calls it, these little hints here. So you see that every time it updates a variable or something, you get the, the information. So, so indeed, the, the return result was zero, and it got stored in our result local variable here, right? Um, so since that's zero, the login should be successful. So we should end up um, initializing login successful to be true. So, oh well, it's, it's, currently, it's currently false, because so we default it to false. Um, and we only set it to true if they successfully log in, if they give the correct password here, right? So if we step over that, this will indeed be zero, so we will set login successful to be true or one, all right? And then the last few lines here are informational um, to help you understand what's going on. So we're gonna print out a couple of our variables, the, the stored password, uh, the user inner password, so you can see on the terminal output that they're both a secret and I output these little uh, left and right um, uh, angle brackets so that you can see the beginning. So there's no like white space or anything around these, right? Um, and, and right, we're checking whether the login was successful or not. So, so it should print that we had a valid password received, okay? Um, so, you know, the size of our character should be one on, on pretty much every system. So if you check the size of character, we'll find out that it's one byte so characters are one one byte uh, data type here. Now here though, this is this is kind of the important thing for understanding this example. So here we're actually going to show you what the address in memory is of the stored password um, buffer on our stack. So we're going to find the, the the address in memory where this eight characters started and where this eight characters started for the stored password and the user entered password uh, buffers here. All right. So if I just step over those, uh, let's see what we got. Okay, so so the first one that we, we I, I display it both in um, so percent p per displays it as a memory and and memory is usually thought of in hexadecimal notation. So it displays the hex address of the memory address, and then I also print it out in decimal, so in base ten, uh, in case you're not too comfortable with hexadecimal. But notice, so in base 10, um, um, the, the user entered password was here at address 296, and then eight bytes later, so, so, uh, so the stored password was, was later in memory, was an after memory, and it was eight bytes, which you would kind of expect if they ended up being together, because the, the user entered password, we allocated eight bytes when we, um, when we um, defined the array for the user entered password. And again, so these are equivalent. This is just the hex address, but here this goes from 1, 8 uh, to 1, 9 to 1, A. You know, so, so it goes from 1, 8 to 1, F, which is, again, 8 addresses or, or 8 bytes. Uh, and then, you know, after 1, F is, is 2, 0 hex, um, and, and, and that's the start of the stored password. Um, so again, make sure you understand. This. So what that means, though, is memory-wise, and, and that, this always happens um, for things that are allocated in the stack by the the, the, the C compiler. So, so it, it, it kind of allocates these in reverse order. So since um, I since I de declared user inner password last, 
it ended up on the stack first. Okay, so so the 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 eight bytes of memory starting here uh, were on our stack from one eight to one f, and then the eight bytes for the store bat password ended up on um, on my stack from two zero to uh, two uh, seven. Okay, so that's that's eight bytes. All right. And if you've understood what I've discussed so far, so, so then you can you should kind of be able to skip ahead to what the, the conclusion here is. So if you've ever overwritten uh, an array in C, you know kind of what's, what the problem is, because if I, I nothing will stop me in, from C, in C from referring to, uh, so the valid indexes are from 0 to 7 if I allocate an array of size 8. So if I refer to index 8 for user entered password, that's gone past the end of my buffer or it's overflowed by buffer. And because this buffer in memory is right after this one, uh, index 8 is actually the same as index 0 for my stored password. All right? So um, I'm not going to step through that again. So you saw a successful run of that, right? Uh, I'm just going to set a breakpoint um, at my last. So often when I'm using the debugger, if I just want it, uh, if I really don't want to step through stuff, you can you can always just use your debugger to step to to set a breakpoint at the last uh, position, right? And then just rerun it. So let's hit F5 to restart a debug session. So now, um, well, let's let's test. So if you enter an invalid password, so bad pass. So again, this is seven characters, right? So now if you look at, um, again, the, the stored password was still a secret, so there was no problem, and bad pass that I just entered took up all, char all eight characters, so the seven visible plus the uh, null terminating character, uh, but um, the user authentication fails, so the passwords don't match, all right? So let's run the debugger again. Um, so what if I overflow the buffer? So um, I use all caps. So my bad pass. All right. So in this case, uh, I'm entering in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm entering in nine characters, right? And remember, the buffer only has room for um, eight. So actually, the first eight, my bad. P A S M Y B A D P A S will end up um, in the buffer that's supposed to hold the user and password, and S is going to end up in index zero for the stored password. Okay, so let's see if that if that worked. Um, oh, and and also you know the the, the null character is still being uh, put in there as well. So notice what ended up in stored password. So so um, if I can. Scroll down here, uh, so so my my bad pas ended up in the eight characters um, in the user entered password buffer, uh, but then the final s in the null character ended up in the the first two characters of the, the stored password buffer. So we overwrote the memory. All right, um, so we still failed here in our authentication because you know my bad and notice now if you just print that out it looks since there's a null character here when I try to display the string it looks like there's just an s in there so so when you do the string compare it's going to compare whether s is equal to my bad pass um, and it will fail in that case okay but there are ways to inspect so this is a way that a hacker would actually attack if, if you if I suspected um, that a buffer overflow is possible here I could examine memory by like stopping my program with a debugger like we're doing like here and see if anything's being overwritten when I enter an input. And once I identify that I can overwrite the, the buffer that holds the, the, um, the stored password by, by entering input, I can craft input to attack this buffer overflow um, vulnerability. All right. So let's try that. So if I run, this will be my last run here, but uh, let's craft some evil input. So, so now I, I know that all characters past character 8 are actually overflowing into the stored password buffer. 
So if I type in eight characters, that'll be my password uh, that, that goes into my regular buffer for the password I enter. And then I craft eight characters to overflow that will match the eight characters that I'm stuffing into my, my stack smashing um, example here, my buffer overflow. All right. So um, indeed, now if we look at the, um, I mean, my user inner password um, was evil core, right? Uh, but I overflowed or I stack smashed evil core into the eight bytes for the, the stored password buffer, okay? Um, and the result is that I have basically hacked the authentication system here. I've, I've fooled it into thinking that I knew what the true password was by crafting a, a buffer overflow attack, okay? So, um, like I said, so like this particular one, the git s vulnerability has been known for a long time and it's been deprecated. Um, and I've noticed on Windows that it doesn't warn you like it does in a lot of places. But, uh, but anyway, um, uh, in lots of places, uh, you really can't even compile with it anymore. But that doesn't mean that this example is, um, you know, outdated because these kinds of buffer overflows are still by far, I think, the, the most common kind of vul vulnerability that, that exists in systems. So you, have, you always have to be very careful about checking your input um, and about making certain that you're managing your memory correctly and, and guarding against allowing any input to go past the bounds that you allocate um, for your memory. Um, okay, so that is it for this video. I hope that that um, example was useful. You know, so if you've never taken a class in security, that's kind of one of the first sorts of things that you would do, sort of in a computer security class. All right, um, and that's it for this video. And I will see you then in the next one.